Hello, welcome to Foreign Entanglements. My name is Matt Duss. I'm a policy analyst at the Center for American Progress. I'm joined today by Meir Javadanfar, a lecturer uh, in Iranian politics at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya in Israel. Meir, how are you today? Very well, thank you, and being co big congratulations for being able to pronounce my surname. I think that uh, deserves much commendation. Um, <laughs> Hello, it's, um, this is Meir Javadanfar speaking with you from Tel Aviv, um, and uh, I look forward to speaking with my colleague and good friend, Mr. Matthew Duss, on the, the events, the recent events in, uh, in the Middle East. Well, great. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to always. Um, so we had uh, the parliamentary elections in Iran on Friday, uh, elections for the Majlis. Um, you published a number of pieces leading up to it, and subsequently... Uh, it seems, by my read, that the you know, supporters of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei have, have done well. Um, Ahmadinejad's faction um, has been has, has shrunk. Uh, he he seems to be kind of he'll be serving out the rest of his term. It seems as a lame duck president. Uh, does that does that flow with what you've seen? Um, yes, uh, and if uh, yes, I think uh, this is very much um, correct analysis in terms of Ahmadinejad's days were over even before this election. Uh, he made the colossal mistake of being at least seen to um, challenge Ayatollah Khamenei's uh, decision last May with regards to the question of who should be uh, the intelligence minister. He fired the intelligence minister, and since then I think Khamenei has had enough. And before these elections, it was pretty obvious that there's going to be just two factions running in these elections. One of them belonged to the uh, Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi's uh, faction, the Paidari faction, which means steadfastness. Um, this is an ultra-right faction. It consists of many former members of the intelligence ministry as well. Um, it had a high ratio, apparently, of them than other factions. And then there's, of course, the Osul Garayan, the, the United Principalist from Jepe Muttahide Osul Garayan, which are you know, more comparatively, and I have to emphasize the word here, comparatively, more um, moderate conservatives than Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi's uh, faction. Mm -hmm. So just to back up to Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi for a minute, he was Ahmadinejad's spiritual advisor for some time. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, in, in, in my book, uh, which I co-authored with, uh, with Yossi Melman, The Nuclear mm -hmm. Sphinx of Tehran, we actually had, uh, we had articles in Iran back then that said that his wife had gone as far as selling her own jewelry for the 2005 uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad presidential campaign. And for the 2009 uh, presidential elections, uh, Mr. Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi uh, issued a fatwa. After, first, there was a fatwa by other clerics which said that cheatings in the elections uh, cannot be allowed and they are they're against Islam. And then Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi issued another fatwa countering that, saying if it's in the interest of, the, of Islam and the regime, which is representing Islam, then, then cheatings are actually allowed. So this is how far he was uh, willing to go right. to protect Ahmadinejad, but it is, the friendship is no more. Right. So explain how that, that relationship broke down. The biggest reason, uh, there are two reasons why uh, the relationship between them uh, broke down. Actually, it's say three, but it's, well, I would say it's two because the two, second and third are related. First and foremost, because Mahmoud Ahmadinejad wants women to be allowed into stadiums. And uh, as you know, in Iran, in football stadiums, women are not allowed, even though football is the most, um, or soccer, as you call it in America, the most popular sport in Iran. Uh, and the other was uh, the concept of Iranian Islam, which Ahmadinejad wanted to bring to fold, mm -hmm. um, which, of course, is, was championed by his second-hand man, Mr. Esfandiyar Mashai, who many clerics hate because he talks about Iranian Islam and Mm -hmm. Clerics feel very threatened because um, the more nationalistic Iran is, the less they have legitimacy to have any, any say in the country's matters. And uh, they were very angered by the fact that the British government sent the Cyrus Cylinder to Iran, um, which has basically the first charter of human rights. Mm -hmm. and, right. and that was, uh, to us Persians, including myself, uh, a very important piece of our history. And it was of tremendous pride of our heritage. And it goes to show that even right-wing um, religious figures such as Ahmadinejad just couldn't hold back. It just, I think it did something. It really moved people to see that and say, okay, you know, this is an Islamic country. Of course, this is, a, this is an Islamic republic. But let's not forget that we're also Iranian. 
Persians, and after that we heard more and more about this concept of Persian Islam, and mm -hmm. that led to basically of them falling out. Right, I think this, this concept of uh, Persian Islam is very, very interesting, and this sort of populist, nationalist version of, of Islam that, that Ahmadinejad has promulgated, as you said, it, it does threaten some of the more conservative clerics. Um, in that, you know, it sort of challenges their role in, in governing the country when you start to bring in the, the, you know, the historical Persian nationalist aspects um, and, and run a program based on that. Um, so that, Ayatollah Yazdi started to pull away from, from Ahmadinejad because of that. And I think, was he one of, one of those who actually accused um, Mashai of sorcery? Um, I, be I, I believe... Um, did I no, I'm not sure if it was him, but there are others who... A lot of things have been said about Mishai. Sorcery was one of them. They, yeah. they, I mean, they made terrible accusations of, uh, you know, using the Quran to do... to, to soil the Quran uh, in order mm. to, call the, to call the devil or something, a sorcery. Mm. I don't know if it was Aytelam Espai Yazdi, but people around him pretty much uh, hate uh, Mishai. This is a... And, and of course, the, 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 the Iranian Islam is, is a threat to the regime because when, when we had a revolution in Iran in 79, they changed the name of the country to the Islamic Republic of Iran. The word Islam came before Iran. And now what Ahmadinejad was doing, it's kind of swapping that around in a way. And it's really incredible, the change in Ahmadinejad. Of, it's really, you know, he started the first four years of being a very controversial figure, somebody who always knew, thought he knows everything, very predictable, very predictable character, and now it's he's changed really. He's become almost uh, schizophrenic, you know. Um, uh, in the same day, he can be Henry Kissinger and Borat. Um, the, <laughs> the, the things he says, the way he acts, some of the things he say, you say, "Oh my God, how can you say something like this?" Uh, in terms of the shock, and then he says, you know, two hours later, he could say something that's totally and absolutely pragmatic and reasonable. I give you the, the example of the UN, when he was at the UN the last mm -hmm. time. He comes, he stands in front of a podium in New York City, he tells the American people that 9-11 was a conspiracy, that it was a, it was a, it was a Zionist plot, it was the American government plot, straight out of a Borat movie sketch, you know, to, to <laughs> sit there and to have the chutzpah to say that in, uh, in, in, in New York City. And then, two hours later, he makes this very, very sanguine, very, very pragmatic offer. Yes, we are interested in holding, halting enrichment in, in Fordo. Even though it's not, of course, he's his, his, um, under his authority to say that, it really shows how Ahmadinejad's character is, is really changing, and he has a very split personality these days. So going to the second faction that you mentioned, the United Principalist Front, this, they gave, got the greater share of, of seats. Um, just describe what their program is. Well, l l l I think it would be easier than that if I say what, is pro what their program isn't. Um, okay. Their program is, is basically anti-Ahmadinejad economic policies. I think, you know, the days of Iran being one of the few countries in the world where the rate of inflation is higher then the rate of interest is going to be over. Mm. Uh, Ahmadinejad kept uh, the interest rates low uh, because one, that was one of his rates, ways of making some of the banks, such as Parsian, if I'm not mistaken, um, of, which are affiliated with Mr. Afsanjani weaker, number one. Number two, it was very populist for him, you know, cheap loans so poor people can get money and that would basically make him popular. I think those days are going to be over. With the sanctions, you can't have that. With real crashing, you can't have that. The regime wants to keep the money in the banks instead of outside, people pulling the money out. And of course, we shouldn't forget that the Revolutionary Guard, that they, they run an empire of something $20 billion, it's been estimated, of, um, of uh, smuggled in goods they bring from, especially from the United Arab Emirates. And the money from that, they deposit in Iranian banks. And I think they're very, you know, very angry at Ahmadinejad for bringing down the interest rates because they're losing money. They live part of the income is from those interest rates. So I think we're going to see an end in the populistic Ahmadinejad, uh, Ahmadinejad policies. I think Mr. Qalibaf, the Tehran mayor, can breathe easier. He's been waiting for the subsidy money. The government was supposed to pay him subsidy money for Tehran Metro for a very long time, and Ahmadinejad is still not paid, I think this is going to be 
Ahmadinejad is going to find it more difficult uh, not to not to help Mr. Khalibov in that regard. And I think in terms of the nuclear sphere, uh, of course, you know, the best example of a of a typical Usul Garayan person if in this sphere is <laughs> Ali Larijani. And Ali Larijani, of course, he supports the nuclear program and everything else, but I think he is far more inclined to support a compromise if he realizes that that Khamenei wants it and the regime could go bankrupt than would Ayatollah Mesbahi as this. So I think if in the future if push comes to shove and the regime is really worried, um, the fact that the Osul Garayan have been ele elected by Khamenei shows that there, is, there will be room for, for maneuver. But I think Khamenei will wait until the last moment until he makes a compromise. So uh, Galibov is seen as a possible successor to Ahmadinejad? Uh, is that correct? Um, he could be a possible, if, if Khamenei doesn't cancel the next presidential right. elections, which I think he right. won't, um, mm -hmm. um, I think Qalibov could be one of the candidates. Ali Larijani could be another, and possibly mm -hmm. Qasem Soleimani, the, the commander of the Quds Force, although that one is not mm -hmm. so sure yet, but possibly. Interesting. So uh, where, where is you know, the IRGC, you know, as we often hear, is, is not a monolithic organization. Right. How are they spread out? amongst the various factions right now and, and kind of what's the impact of the elections on, on, on the various groups within the IRGC? Um, you know, as you said, IRGC, it's, it's not a, you know, it's, it, it's not just a single united organization. I think, I think what we could say with the a safe assumption from what uh, my understanding is that I think majority belong to the mainstream and mainstream mm -hmm. also get on the, the principalist. I think amongst them, I'm sure there are people who support Mesbah Yazi, and as we saw, there are people who supported the Green Movement. Um, but I think most probably they stand with the principalists, but more importantly, um, I think the commanders, the top echelon, stands with Khamenei, no matter what he mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. But I think the longer the sanctions continue, the more people within the business echelons of IRGC, who, who are quite important, could start questioning the way Khamenei is, uh, is handling the nuclear program. See, um, Mehdi Khalaji from uh, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, whose work on Iran, especially, you know, the various factions within the Iranian regime, I always really appreciate, wrote a piece a couple weeks ago uh, advising um, the U.S. To, to, to focus on elements within the Revolutionary Guard, um, kind of going against the conventional wisdom, or what has been the conventional wisdom, that, that uh, the Supreme Leader should be the focus of, of efforts to reach out. Um, his, his basic argument was that the, the, the Revolutionary Guards, um, elements within the Guards, are, are so invested in various aspects of Iran's economy that the damage that's being done to that economy, the economic isolation, provides, you know, could provide an impetus for them to, 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 to pressure the regime more, to, to be more forthcoming on the nuclear issue. What do you, what do you make of that? Um, I, I agree with his assessment that uh, that there are people within the business community of the IRGC who are taking a lot of hits uh, because of the sanctions. Uh, Iran is a normal country, and like every other country, on every policy, there's at least two opinions. Um, um, very much like on Israel, on every policy, there's 25 different opinions. I'm sure the same applies to, to Iran. And I'm sure there are people who don't agree with the way Khamenei uh, is continuing with the nuclear program. And, and we see now there are former members of the IRGC who are questioning his, his position. A former MP said live on air that Khamenei should be, should, he should answer questions. And the, the, the term we use in Iran is estiza. Estiza is when you bring an official in front of the majlis and they have to answer questions about their performance. And he, it's unbelievable that people are saying this about Khamenei now. Not so, so it's kind of like supreme leader's question. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so when you know, um, so you know, there are being people are not high-ranking people, but former IRGC people are saying this, which is still in it, in on its own something that's that's unprecedented and worth noting. Um, but you know, the question is, I agree with Mehdi that there are people like that. I'm sure, but the question is, how are you going to do it, Matt? Where are you mm -hmm. go? How are you going to? What's the mechanism of 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 the, talking to them, would they be willing to talk? Because they know if they go above Khamenei's head, it could mm -hmm. be the end of their life. Right. I, I don't, you know, the divide and rule, of course, everybody wants to create, uh, you know, divisions within the regime so that, you know, those who are hardliners are weakened and those who are moderates are strengthened. 
this is all part of this dual track mm -hmm. approach also of, you know, mm -hmm. diplomacy sanctions, weaken the hardliners, strengthen the moderates. But I just don't don't know how you can, the mechanics of how you can do that, and I don't think Khamenei would allow it. Is that, I mean, looking, at, you know, stepping back and looking at, you know, who's where, who who's up and who's down after the elections of last Friday, what would you say the, the you know, the implications are for a nuclear deal? I, I would say they were not that great before. Um, it seems to me that if Khamenei has reestablished himself, has kind of, you know, slapped down Ahmadinejad's gang and, and, and reestablished himself as a, at the top, managing a perhaps smaller group of competing factions, but still, it seems to me, a bit more secure in, in his power. Does that bode well for negotiations or poorly? I think, of course, it bodes well if Khamenei is interested in reaching mm -hmm. a compromise. Um, I think it's a good sign, albeit a small one, that he didn't choose Mesbah's faction. Mm -hmm. If he would have chosen Mesbah's faction, oh my god, I, I wouldn't even want to imagine it's Ayatollah, Ayatollah, Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi. I mean, he's a yeah. messianic, his nickname is, uh, you know, Mesbah mm -hmm. in Persian, trines with Temsah, uh, and, and it's a crocodile. And, you know, they call it Ayatollah Crocodile. You should speak to Nikahan Nika Kosar. Who is that, is that's the, the insatiable crocodile. The insatiable, that's, that, in that's it. Netanyahu was talking about that, that crocodile, <laughs> of course. And when you talked yeah, about... We'll, 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 Ahmadinejad being a lame duck, don't forget, Matt. It's Ahmadinejad mm -hmm. lame nuclear duck. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, we'll, we'll get to that in a sec, but I do just want to, uh, getting back to Ayatollah Yazdi. Um, Mesbah Yazdi, uh, because there's another Mesbah Ayatollah Yazdi. We don't want right. to, even though, you know, we don't want to mix right. them up. Yes, thank you. Um, so just very quickly, I mean, this point about him being messianic, and I know this is something you've written about, and we'll, and we'll have a link to your, your excellent book about Ahmadinejad, which gets into this uh, quite a bit. But uh, there are often assumptions made about the leadership in Iran, about, you know, their belief in the 12th Imam, the return of the 12th Imam, and uh, apocalypse and everything. But I think as you explain, this, you know, Ayatollah Khamenei himself is not messianic. Correct. Um, but Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi is. Correct. Um, and, and so just explain that distinction a little bit for the viewers. Uh, me <coughs> Excuse me, Mesbah Yazdi is a... Is a is a messianic ayatollah, comes originally from the city of Yazd. Um, he belonged to the Haqqani school, uh, which, is a, which is a religious institution in Iran. Afterwards, he, he left because he fell out with the people who were there because the Haqqani school started teaching things such as English and, and Persian, and, and he fell out with them. He was, he was close to people like such as Beheshti, Ayatollah Beheshti, who was assassinated in 1981. And he also belonged to a secretive society called Hujatiyeh, which is a messianic organization which Khomeini disbanded because he basically found them too, too right-wing. And, mm -hmm. and, and the Hujatiyeh don't believe that there could be a government until the Mahdi arrives. Uh, so let's just, let's just stop for a minute and know uh, the Hujatiyeh were too right-wing for the Ayatollah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's, uh, just want to underline that. Sure. Um, uh, and then, uh, he, you know, after Khamenei started, uh, get, he became supreme leader, and after, especially after Khatami came to power, who, which was a kind of a challenge to, to Khamenei, Khamenei saw him as a challenge, um, uh, he started getting close again to Mesbah Yazdi, and you know, Mesbah Yazdi got more funding for his Imam Khomeini institution, mm -hmm. and, and basically, you know, he's getting more power, but he's not, he doesn't have any say over Iran's nuclear program. He's close to Khamenei for domestic things. He's got no say over foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Khamenei is not messianic. There's, there's nothing anywhere at any point which says that Ali Khamenei is, is messianic. Right. I mean, so, I mean, we see, you know, American politicians, GOP candidates like Rick Santorum making these assertions about how Iranian leaders you know, are yearning for the apocalypse. And, and, and unfortunately for certain sections of the American right, this is now a piece of conventional wisdom, just this idea that the Iranian leadership is, is hungry to create you know, this, this massive conflagration as part of their religious belief, but it's simply not true. But the, I think, Mr., you know, not just Rick Santorum, but others in the U.S., both from both sides of the political aisle, should, should observe that the Iranians are actually having this, you know, they have had enough of the Palestinian issue. Um, mm -hmm. They gave, uh, Yasser Arafat was the first official who visited Iran after the revolution. Mm -hmm. He received millions of dollars. 
And then within a year he switched sides and supported Saddam Hussein after he invaded Iran because we are Persians and he's an Arab. So he wanted to be with the Arab side. So Ayatollah Khomeini said that not only, not just him, if, if his plane so much as flew over Iran, he would shoot his plane down. Hmm. And, and then we had Hamas, who Iran invested billions of dollars in all these years. And we see now that Hamas is defying Iran. Gilad Shalit hmm. is at home, hmm. this is against Iranian wishes. PLO, Hamas is talking to PLO, this is against Iranian wishes. Hamas is going against Syrian, uh, Syrian uh, opposition, this is against Iranian wishes. Really, I mean, are the Iranians going to go to a nuclear war for these guys? I'm yes. not so sure. Uh, ex even before they were unlikely to go into a nuclear war. I think now it's even far less likely. Never mind nuclear war. I don't think they'll be willing to get into a conventional war for Hamas. And in fact, the, the way things are continuing, Matt, I would be willing to risk to say um, that if there is a war, God forbid, between Iran and Israel, I don't think Hamas would fire Israel. I don't think no, Hamas. actually, actually, Hamas, a Hamas spokesman just, I just read this before we started this, a Hamas spokesman said almost exactly that in the event of, a, of, a, of you know, an Israeli strike or, or some kind of crisis between Israel and Iran, Hamas would not necessarily join on Iran's behalf. Hezbollah would, no, no, no question, but I don't think Hamas would. Mm -hmm. And I think even then Hezbollah would, would, would join in reluctantly because, yeah. first of all, they're going to do very badly militarily. And second of all, how are they going to resupply? Where is the weapons going to come from? Syria is over. Mm -hmm. So um, let's move to, um, to the recent meetings. This, just these past few days here in, in the U.S., it's been the, the annual conference of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Um, we had a meeting at the White House yesterday between Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President Obama. Um, what did you make of the statements coming out of that meeting? I think both meetings are, are a more sophisticated version of the, of the good cop, bad cop show. I think the two are now far more synced in terms of Mr. Obama being uh, the good cop and, and, and Benjamin Netanyahu being the bad cop. Um, I think that basically this is a very strong pressure tactic, although I, I sometimes do worry that Netanyahu may go on his own to do it. Um, this is something that does, it, it is a possibility, although I don't think it's an overwhelming possibility, but mm. Netan, if anybody would do that, it would be Netanyahu. Um, but for now, I, I don't see the chances of war, and I think both sides are now really fine-tuning this, uh, this, uh, you know, this strategy of, of, of pressuring Iran, and, and I think the Iranians are, you know, they have to be worried. I, I, you know, what Netanyahu said, uh, you know, okay, he makes his own statements and he didn't say anything new. But one thing that President Obama said, and, and if I were in, in the Iranian leadership, I'd be very worried, is when he said, we don't have a containment strategy. That's very worrying for the Iranians. In what way? Basically, that the Americans are not going to allow nuclear Iran. That, uh, look, we know the Iranians are not making a bomb yet. This is according to uh, our, it's that this is the Israeli intelligence view, and mm -hmm. this is the American intelligence view. Mm -hmm that both sides know that the Iranians are not making a bomb yet. And if at any point Khamenei starts putting, going down the military path, then, then, you know, he could get attacked. And I think this is a very clear red line. And, and you know, of course, we can talk about the difference between Israeli red lines and, and American red line, but I think even the American red line is terrible news for the Iranian leadership. So do you think they take that very seriously? Because, I mean, the criticisms of, of President Obama in is that well? His administration has also been talking up, or talking about the negative consequences of a military attack in Iran. So this kind of puts the Iranians at ease. Um, no, I, well, he, he, you've got to you've got to have both sides, really. I mean, uh, you can't not talk about uh, the negative sides of a war. I mean, I, mean, I mean, we're not doing this. Is not propaganda. Any, any self-respecting mm -hmm. leader has got to has got to talk about the negative sides of a of a possible conflict. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, he's, um, he's doing his job, and I don't think that's sending the wrong message to the Iranians. The, I think the Iranians are quite... I think what the Iranians are worried about is the damage they're suffering. And, of course, we know the Iranians are going to reply if, if we attack them. It's just, mm -hmm. who's, is, is, is the price worth it? That's all. Yeah. Right. I mean, that is really the question. What level of risk are we willing to accept? Yes. Um, there's the very the front-end risks of an attack, I think, 
most people agree that there would be some very, very serious consequences, both economically, militarily, strategically, um, inside Iran uh, as well. Correct. Um, but then, and then you hold those up against the risks of a, a nuclear weaponized Iran, and you know it's 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 a judgment call um, as to which of those kind of sets of risks are are worse or and and less acceptable. Well, again, you know, I, I wouldn't like to be the person who has to make that decision. But again, do, are we not there yet? You know, Matt. Mm -hmm. What we have to right. do is to we are continuing with the sanctions. Right, and that's um, Obama's main argument. Of course, you know, and, and I think he's right. Um, but Netanyahu is doing his job as, as being the bad cop. You know, you can't expect mm -hmm. him. He's got to come and, you know, act like the, the, the guy who's tough and he wants action. And, and you have mm -hmm. Obama who's acting like the, you know, the, the party who wants more moderation. I think this is part of a show, to be honest with mm -hmm. you. Um, and uh, this is synchronized between the two sides, it seems to me. Um, but, you know, the... The over, nobody wants war, of course not, but, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, what we have to emphasize here, Matt, and I think would be very fair and objective to emphasize, is that there is a very fair offer on the table for the Iranian government. Mm -hmm. yeah. At no point, and I emphasize this, at no point has an Israeli government, has even Netanyahu ever said that we are against an Iranian nuclear program full stop. I don't buy that for a minute. Mm -hmm. Israel has been against Iran, the Iranian government cheating the IAEA, and Iran making all these excuses that now, okay, IAEA now is in the pro-American hands. I don't, um, you know, Iran can have its nuclear program and can have good relations with the international community. It's Khamenei's call. I really see mm -hmm. it as Khamenei's call. I think if the IAEA, and I, and I really want to emphasize what I'm about to say, if the IAEA gives a full, clean bill of health to the Iranian nuclear program, it will be incredibly difficult not to justify and not to allow Iran enrichment on its own soil. So uh, what I would like to know is why, don't the Iranian, why doesn't the Iranian government cooperate? Do you think the Iranian, uh, you know, do you think they, the Iranian regime has good reasons to fear full cooperation with the IAEA apart from... The you know, is there another explanation from that they're just trying to conceal, you know, possible weapons programs? Well, the Iranian government says that, uh, you know, if they cooperate, the Iranian government's basically worried that, you know, an agreement with the U.S. could lead to a downfall of. They see this as a step towards regime mm -hmm. change. Right. And uh, but you got to you got to think how. Let, 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 please let me just think this through. How can nuclear agreement be linked to regime change? The only way it can is. Nuclear agreement leads to improvement in relations between Iranian people and Amer American government. The two countries get close, and the regime no longer has its anti-American card to play. Yeah. And basically, that, at that point, it fears being overthrown. So what does that tell you? It tells you that this is a regime that's not interested in good relations with the U.S., number one. Number two, this is an incredibly weak regime that all it has left is the anti-American glue, which is holding it together. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, that, if that's true, I mean, that paints a pretty dire picture for the possibility of any kind of, you know, agreement that could, that could avert military action. Um, I think that the sanctions, if we could push it to a point, and if we allow them to bite, I think they could reach a critical economic point. And we could see people such as in the business class of the business echelons of the of the IRGC putting unbearable pressure on Khamenei. I think the way Khamenei is going at it right now is he's got a total reserves of money. He's looking at how much is his in incoming and how much is he, are his outgoings and how long can he live off from this account. I think the day that account starts to run dry is the day we're going to see uh, the Iranian regime coming to talk. So do, should we be doing a better, by we, I mean, you know, the U.S. and its partners, be doing a better job of articulating the, the off-ramps that are available to Iran um, in a more sort of face-saving way? I mean, what about the, the idea of taking, explicitly taking regime change off the table? Are there any inducements sort of that, that the U.S. and its partners could be offering Iran that we, that we aren't to possibly smooth the, the way toward some agreement? Um, 
I think there are, you know, um, there are two things you could do. Sorry, Matt, can I go and switch quickly switch on the light? Sure. Please come. So in terms of inducements, I think there has to be two. One is that to make it clear that we are not interested in regime change and to put it in writing. Number two, to say to Iran that if the all IAEA questions are answered, if the IAEA, of course, IAEA gives Iran a clean bill of health, and, uh, we know that, and that we can have good safeguards for the Iranian nuclear program, um, that the question of enrichment on Iranian soil would be allowed up to 5% with a strict um, you know, additional protocol visits, you know, SNAP visits mm -hmm. all, and, and all the works, very, very tight regime. On the other hand, I think something that's missing in terms of, the, um, in terms of warning Iran, I think the Iranian government, Khamenei, is sitting down and, and basically looking at a graph. He's basically saying that, um, you know, for now we're paying this price, the price is going to go up, however, we're going to reach the, the, the maximum here, this is the break-even point, this is when we make a bomb, mm -hmm. and then afterwards everybody will uh, basically pack up and go, sanctions will be dropped because there's no point, and then the cost will come down, this is, and this is where we're going to rec recoup the cost of, 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 our, of our nuclear program, of all the investment. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we have to send a message to the Iranian government to say, that right now your costs are going up. If you reach this point of making a bomb, we're not going to stop sanctions against you. So the, pr the, the cost is not going to come down after that. It's going to continue increasing. And I think this is very important to, uh, it's very important to, to, to send a message to, to the Iranian government. So looking at, uh, going back to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech last night, I mean, I understand the point you're making about the good cop, bad cop thing. Um, but it seems that when the the Prime Minister of Israel constantly refers to Auschwitz and the Book of Esther in regard to the threat he perceives from Iran, you know, he's really not leaving himself any options um, for the future beyond taking military action. I really, um, first of all, the the Esther, Queen Esther, Purim, and and and, and the Auschwitz. Um, uh, uh, c comparisons and analogies are wrong. It's wrong. We're not dealing with Hitler, we're not dealing with Haman. It's, you know, this is, I, I disagree. However, and, and it, it discredits us, it discredits us. But Matt, I gotta tell you, you know, you read more and more articles about, you know, there are some people who still believe, I don't know if there's any officials, but you know, there's some people who believe, oh no, you know, it's okay to live with a nuclear Iran. I don't believe for a minute that a nuclear Iran is going to be the end of the state of Israel. This is not a re crazy regime. This is a regime that's very interested in its own interests. Absolutely. You know, it's not going to want to annihilate, annihilate itself because of the Palestinians. Um, I think, you know, it, a nuclear Iran is not going to be the end of Israel. It's not an existential threat. But at the same time, Matt, you know, let me, let me just put, put this to, to you, this question. Pakistan and India, they are both nuclear states. Do they talk to each other? They talk, right? Mm -hmm. Union, Soviet Union and, and USA, when right. Soviet Union was around, was, they talked to each other, right? There was a hotline. Mm -hmm. right. Right. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon, not only are we going to face the question of proliferation, which is going to make this, reg this region much more dangerous, the Iranian regime is not going to be willing to talk to us. I don't see the Iranian regime all of a sudden being willing to, to have a hotline with the state of Israel. Now, can you imagine when there is an article somewhere that calls for the elimination of Israel, appearing in the press, and then there's some movement of forces within Iran. They don't want to talk to us. How are we going to diffuse this tension? And the Israeli leadership is going to get nervous. I mean, we, we could have an accident. Yeah. Um, this is, it's very serious. So I don't accept the argument that, you know, oh, it's over. Khamenei is the new Hitler. No, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But I don't accept the argument some people put forward that, oh, it's going to be all right if Iran has a nuclear weapon. It's not going to be all right. The way this regime behaves will make an already very tenuous relationship between Iran and Israel more tenuous. And, and you know, the fact that it doesn't want to have anything to do with Israel... Um, even the North Koreans who hate South Korea, they talk to each other. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that there would be no communications because of the Iranian regime, we could have very, very serious situations in this, 
in this regime, region. Not to mention, of course, other countries wanted to go nuclear, such as Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey. So that that brings me to the, the possibility of a, a regional non-proliferation arrangement. I, I saw a story last last week, um, I think it was in Haaretz, about um, kind of an interesting sort of meeting that took place, I think it was in Europe, um, where there were representatives from Iran and Israel and other countries, and there was an exchange between the Iranian representative and former Mossad chief Ephraim Halavi, where the, the Iranian representative basically called out Israel for its hypocrisy on the nuclear program, you know, challenging Israel's stance on, on Iran's nuclear program, you know, saying, well, you're hypocrites because you guys have a bunch of nuclear weapons, you should get rid of those. And, and Halavi responded by saying, well, oh, wait, so, so now you recognize Israel when it comes to the nuclear question. And I thought that was great. It seemed, I mean, is there exactly. a way to kind of to kind of expand that out to say, okay, we understand Iran has some legitimate concerns. Um, Israel obviously has legitimate security concerns. Is there a way to kind of fold recognition of Israel by Iran, even if not, you know, fulsome recognition, but at least some measure of communication um, into a kind of regional non-proliferation architecture? Um, to be honest with you, we all want to live in a region that's uh, rid of nuclear weapons. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's going to happen for a number of reasons. Number one, I don't think the Iranians are going to recognize Israel. I don't think that's a political mm -hmm. price that the Iranian leadership mm -hmm. is going to be prepared to pay. Number two, and I'm talking technically, Israel has never admitted having nuclear weapons. So how can you get rid of mm -hmm. something that you've never admitted having? And, mm -hmm. uh, and number three, I think with the with the with the Arab Spring and and I, and, I, and I think you should probably share my sentiments. Uh, we started with a very positive, uh, you know, positive way, but there are now dangers emerging. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think this is going to actually make it even more difficult to convince any Israeli government to, to agree to this. So, of mm -hmm. course, it's a, it's, is it hypocrisy? Of course it's hypocrisy. You know, uh, one person uh, uh, has something and the other person doesn't. But uh, you have to also see, you know, the, the question here, Matt, is behavior. Um, you know, Israel mm -hmm. has never admitted having a nuclear weapon, number one, and Israel has never admitted any, you know, threatened anybody with, uh, with uh, nuclear, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, nuclear weapons. And I think the fact that the Iranian government doesn't, doesn't even have nuclear weapons and it's threatening us with uh, mm -hmm. elimination goes to show that here it's not just a question of technically owning some uh, right. nuclear weapon, it's, it's how you behave, which is, uh, which is very important. Right. No, I didn't mean to make an equivalence there. I just I no, thought no, no, sure. I thought I thought what Halavi did in terms of calling out the the Iranians for you know just pointing out that oh you've recognized Israel in this one instance, um, I thought was was quite clever. Um, but you know something else that doesn't get mentioned, Matt. You know when we talk about a dangerous nuclear Iran, you know the the whole suicidal school of thought. The Iranians are suicidal. Why don't they just fire one of the chemical weapons at us? Right. You know they've they've mm -hmm. got it. They've had it for the last six or seven years. They're suicidal. They want him, if I tell him Esbah Yazdi wants to have an appointment with the Mahdi, if he, if he doesn't have the power, mm -hmm. or if Khamenei did, why, why, why invest all this money in nuclear program? You could just fire a chemical weapon and you can have the war that you want. Mm -hmm. You know, this regime, I don't think at any point is going to want to, to, to go, you know, because of the Palestinians. But I really have to, I'm really surprised at the continuous mistakes that this regime is making which goes to show that the nuclear program more and more every day is about the interest of the regime, a regime which thrives in isolation, than the interest of the people of Iran who want to have better relations with everybody. All right, well, I think that's a great place to close. Thanks so much, Mayor. Great talking to you as always. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you soon. See you soon. Bye.